Hello everyone. Uh, I'm Feng Tang. I come from China and I work for the Intel in Linux System Engineering. Previously, it's the Open Source Technology Center. So today, I will talk about the uh, fast boot. Uh, so, uh, so here's some background. Uh, I think uh, everybody wants his uh, Linux devices to boot faster, no matter it towards the embedded device, that's your phone, the laptop desktop, or the servers. Uh, and the back in the 2008, Aya and the Org have uh, introduced the boot links in five seconds. I think at that time, it was a big war wow. And uh, yeah, at that time, I was very impressed. Uh, and uh, recently, the kernel boot time has been improved hugely. So, but uh, is this all done? Uh, actually, we, have, we still have a lot of things can do. Here's the agenda, so uh, my talk will be two parts. The first one will be share, sharing uh, what we've done for our platform. Uh, the next one will be dis discuss the potential optimization points, what we can do next. Uh, so here's the reason we need to do the uh, boot op optimization, because we, we were working on the automotive uh, solution and there was a hard requirement from the United States the Department of Transportation that the rear camera must be functional after you press the power button in two seconds. And in that platform, the boot includes uh, several phases, including the hardware power RC, the firmware, the boot loader, the hypervisor, and the uh, kernel and the user space. And print kernel already took about five uh, 100 milliseconds, and the bu budget left for us is about four milliseconds. Uh, since it's, it's running on a uh, hypervisor, the initial kernel boot time is about uh, 300, uh, sort of, sorry, the three seconds, and uh, finally we, we cut it to about uh, 300 milliseconds, which uh, meets the requirement, and the car is uh, close to the mass production. Um, Here's a platform info. So uh, this, this platform is uh, based on the x86. So it, it has a four core CPU with, uh, and with eight gigabytes RAM. And it, it uses the EMMC card as a root file system. And software info is uh, we can see that we are running on top of a hypervisor because the automotive needs some isolation for the security reasons. So we're running based on the uh, hypervisor, which is called Arca. Uh, recently, uh, it has the uh, first batch of these patches has been merged to the upstream kernel. And in the, uh, in the left, it's, uh, this is uh, very similar to the Zen. The left side is uh, like the Doom Zero, which is a service uh, OS. And uh, we're using the Linux as the service OS, and uh, it's running with a 4.19 kernel. Uh, here we will talk about the methodology. So I think everybody knows this. So it has three steps. Uh, first one will be profiling. We need to marry the data. And then we do the analyzing to find the hotspots. And then the optimization. And this is a recursive process. Uh, we optimize one point, and then do the next, and the next till we uh, meet the target. Uh, next one is uh, first, uh, to do the boot optimization, we need to uh, get the accurate kernel boot time. And uh, currently, uh, I think the boot time could be divided to three phases. Uh, the first part is the kernel decompression. Then the second is the dark phase uh, we all see uh, in our kernel message log, start with some uh, all zero, and then the, with a normal timestamp. All zero because uh, that the clock is not initialized yet. So here you can see uh, it's just like the sun, sunrise. Before the sunrise, we, we can, we, we, there's all dark, we don't know the time. Uh, 
Next is about how to check the kernel time. Uh, we have several ways. Uh, we have the systemd analyze, which is uh, comes with the systemd, and uh, we can also check from the predicate timestamp. And last one is uh, we we can just check the find the keywords, the running something as the initial pr process says. But these commands are uh, a lot accurate enough. We can see from the right picture, the system D analyze actually uh, tell you the time for the normal phase plus the use space loading. Uh, and uh, the and the run uh, something as the initiate is actually just to show the normal phase. So to to get the real boot time, we need some uh, tools. Uh, here talks about the just brief the uh, profiling tools we we used. So the initial code debug is is very key, and based on that, we have the very powerful uh, tool boot chart, which can give us a good view of how the time is spent. And then. He, Next is a print K with a absolute timestamp. In last uh, slide, I, I say that the, all the existing uh, tools uh, actually uh, don't give the uh, right time. The only thing we can trust is actually the, 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 the timer. For the x86, it's a TSC. Uh, after the system is power on, it's just uh, increasing at the, the uh, fixed rate, so we just uh, f f during our profiling we make we have our own print k with the absolute timestamp, and we can load actual time. We have been spent. Uh, uh, after next is, uh, is uh, the tools to to check the hotspots. With, with these tools, we already with the boot chart with the print key time, with the initial code debug, we can also check, check out <coughs> many things from the, the picture, from the log, but still there's, there's a lot of things missing. Uh, because for some functions, which is not covered by the initial code debug, uh, we don't know it, and we need to give some special care to them. Simply, we can just add some print key uh, in the uh, enter and the entrance and the exit of that function. Uh, also, there would be something uh, hiding in this uh, boot traffic picture is a uh, asynchronous uh, initialization. Uh, it will hide a lot of things from the log or the boot chart, and we need to manually dump them. All these things we, all the tools we use is just to uh, find the real hotspots and the real, uh, the real hotspots. Okay. Uh, next one is uh, analyze. So uh, with the uh, profile tools, we need to know, get the whole picture of the boot process. Uh, that is, we need to know every milliseconds uh, where it is used. And uh, you, and then we need to check how and why it takes so much time, and uh, whether it is really necessary to take so much time. Um, by this, we can uh, find the hotspots. Uh, so I, so there are three ma major uh, hotspots which consume uh, much time in the boot process. Uh, one is kind of the workaround for the drivers. Uh, also, there will be some less unnecessary modulus and configures building the kernel. Uh, we need to uh, get rid of them one by one. And, uh, and then also there are some, uh, some unexpected small functions. Usually we, we just will ignore them, but they actually takes a lot of time. So we have to prof profile very carefully. Uh, so next, uh, next one shows uh, how the 
is the profile result, which is uh, the upper one is the whole system from the from from you press the power button, that will be goes to the hardware. That's uh, some power management IC, and then it goes to the formal initial sheet. Then the boot loader. The purple one is the small one, is the hypervisor initializing time. And then comes the kernel part. And next is the user space. For the kernel part, uh, the low one uh, is kind of a breakdown. Uh, it just lists the, it's, it's just uh, made uh, from the time point of view. Uh, for the biggest uh, time consumer for the for our kernel boot, so we can see the kernel incorporation, the memory initialization, the SNP initiate, which means that you bring up all the uh, long BSP boot processors. And next one is the formal initiate. Uh, it actually uh, enumerates all the devices in the, the most of the devices in the system and they load some the tables. Uh, next is mostly is uh, just driver, st driver stuff, the graphics, the storage, some the IO controllers, and the last one is uh, the file system mounting. So. Uh, here yeah, we have uh, just an uh, overview of the other hotspots. Uh, it's uh, driver uh, asynchronous probing, the root file system mounting, the memory initialization, the color modulus and the color configs, and the graphics is a big part of the, our boot process. And the last one is the virtualization cost. Uh, here is uh, some uh, some uh, profile data. The green means uh, it used to be a big trouble, and uh, we uh, can can solve them. And the black ones means uh, the, the the current status. At least some of the most time consuming of the final platform. And uh, yeah, we hope we can still improve more, but but we'll talk uh, talk about it later. So. Uh, the, the driver asynchronous uh, pro framework is, is actually set up 10 years ago, but the uh, real driver really use it. And uh, so uh, it's pretty simple. If we use the uh, uh, asynchronous probing, we can put the uh, initial tasks onto the multi calls, and it, they will be run in parallel and save a lot of time. Uh, so, and the, to do that, it's uh, simple. You can just uh, set the driver's prototype. And also, uh, there's another way to easy to try. If you want to just try on your own system, you can use, uh, use the last uh, sentence, just to add them to the command line, uh, just to, to see if this uh, asynchronous probing can if they can save time on your pla own platform without uh, building a new kernel, just uh, using the existing one, ch change the command line. So next is a picture of the original boot. So we, we can see here, most of them, the, the driver uh, are boot serial. The only one good citizen is the MMC driver. Oh, sorry. Uh, it, it already, uh, uh, use the uh, asynchronous probe. It uh, put its probe uh, scanning function into a worker thread worker, so that it could run uh, in parallel. Uh, next one is uh, is a uh, boot with uh, asynchronous probing. We can see uh, many drivers are running in parallel, and we can see uh, we got uh, about uh, twenty percent improvement, just, uh, just to simply uh, make them uh, asynchronous. So, so I think here what we can do is just uh, check our drivers to see if there uh, could be uh, use asynchronous probing. It could benefit all the platforms running by these drivers. 
Uh, next one is the root file system mounting, which is a critical chain. Uh, and uh, the problem we've met is mostly about the driver's efficiency. Uh, our pl platform, even we, uh, as, as I said, we are using the EMMC uh, card as the root file system. Still, the, the SATA initialization takes about uh, up to 200 milliseconds. Uh, and the, actual, the real fast, uh, root storage takes about the, uh, 40 to 100 milliseconds. Since it's a critical chain, we just want to make, want, want it to, uh, to run as, as quick as possible. So we did, did some, did something. We moved the driver to the earlier stage of the initiate, which is by changing the Mac file. It's all the inside Mac file. And uh, we also disabled, in our platform, we have several uh, controllers for the SD host controllers, we disable the not the used ones, and we also disable the non-used protocols, uh, and also we do some we remove some hack 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 uh, hacky delay inside the original driver, and so the last one uh, one note is about we need to add the root weight keywords into the command line. It will tell you. That is how much time your system is waiting for the, your root file system to be ready. Initially, uh, it's about several hundred milliseconds in our system. And uh, with these uh, optimizations, they are solved. Uh, next one is uh, about the deferred memory initialization. So the, our system has uh, eight gigabytes and it cost more than 100 milliseconds. It's actually about 150 initially. And actually in our early boot, we don't need that much memory. And uh, with the memory hot plug feature, we just, uh, during the boot phase, we initialize about two gigabytes and then let's use space to initialize the, the rest. Oh. Uh, I, I think uh, for this particular use case, uh, hot plug feature is probably not the best because um, mm -hmm. currently deferred memory initialization, uh, I mean kernel supports deferred memory initialization where you can um, initialize memory after SMP init, so um, all CPUs are used to initialize stack pages and uh, virtually it would eliminate like all 150 milliseconds that uh, you use to initialize memory. Uh, but uh, as of right now, it only works per um, node. And since it's a single node system, yeah, yes, it yes, won't yes. work. But mm -hmm. uh, there is a set of patches flying around. There is like um, uh, K-tasks, which uh, also initialize memory uh, right after SMP. So you could uh, remove all the hot plug support from the kernel and won't have to spend the time initializing the first two gigabyte and so on. It would be still much faster. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know the exact status, but in the following improvements, I, I actually mentioned that if we can use some case thread to do the memory, deferred memory initialization in kernel. Uh, you said the current kernel already has this feature? Uh, deferred memory initialization is part of the kernel. Uh, uh, yes, there's a, a deferred memory initialization configure. Yes. But, that, but, but I don't think that's uh, this kind of things. Uh, what I mean is that uh, with this, uh, uh, with initial initializing first two okay. gigabytes of memory and then initializing the rest by hot plugging it later, you basically delay uh, the rest of the memory initialization to the hot plug, uh, hot plug phase to the user space when you have other CPUs doing some other work starting the user processes. Yes. But uh, you can initialize all the memory fast right after SMP init. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay, okay, exactly the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, you, if you I use that the you, deferred yeah. memory initialization we'll talk plus about the, the later, yeah, K, will, yes, plus yeah, the K-task yeah. patches. Yeah, 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 exactly, okay, yeah. That would be, that would be a slide, that, yeah, almost the same, same thing. Uh, it's about what we can do. Uh, 
Uh, next one is uh, about the CPU frequency. Uh, the CPU frequency actually matters a lot, uh, especially for those uh, uh, without uh, IOS operations. For, for, for example, the decompression. Uh, in, in our birth, uh, our kernel, our CPU can usually run the, at the 1.9 gigahertz, and it has a turbo mode, which is running the, at 2.4 gigahertz. If we force it, force it to run the 2.4 uh, gigahertz, we, we get a lot of uh, improvement for the overall both, both time. And uh, because uh, CPU frequency usually is set by the BIOS or the firmware, and the uh, kernel can only control it by until the, the, the CPU frequency subsystem getting initialized. Uh, so um, my question here will be, can we enable it and make it a kernel uh, config option so that we can benefit from it? And uh, I know it may, it depends on platform. If we force uh, the, the highest frequency, it may hurt some hardware. But uh, if there's uh, some option, that would be uh, very cool. Uh, maybe work with, um, say, firmware standards bodies to give us, uh, say, UEFI interface to change the core frequency and then just in the Linux boot stub call that because I don't, I don't really want to have um, 500 different uh, frequency drivers in, in early boot up code for a generic distro kernel. Uh -huh. But um, firmware already has to be able to, to set something up. So we could at least enable the kernel call into firmware to set the frequency right when we join, when, when we enter the kernel, right? Yeah, yes, yeah. It, actually, for, for setting our frequency, it's just uh, right, right, uh, right in. Writing two registers, it's very easy. But we raise a re request to the firmware team. They don't care. Why even request firmware to change the frequency? Why not like uh, have this as a setting of the firmware? Like So basically, when kernel is started, firmware already... Because like the firmware doesn't know why, when the kernel starts, and you don't necessarily want to um, run, the, say, the, the grub polling loop really fast. That, that's not useful. Well, right? I mean, it can uh, switch to the highest frequency right before jumping to the kernel. How do you know when you jump to the kernel? The firmware knows when it jumps the to the kernel. The firmware does not know when it jumps to the kernel. The firmware knows when it executes random EFI applications. That's what it knows. Right, but uh, have a setting that, like, before it uh, executes the... You mean, you mean exit boot services and then just go, like, sure. That, that's, the, that's the implicit way of doing it. Um, right, right. But... I personally would prefer if we just can, could make it explicit because maybe in another use case you rather want to have the lowest frequency for other reasons. I don't know, because your kernel just happens to know that it wants to run really slow now. It's still possible to do, but for all kinds of boots, of course. That for it, it, all, all a all generic interface kind of makes more sense in my book. Um, so you're saying you requested that on, from, from your firmware team and they didn't reply? Yeah, they, 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 they are busy. They, so we choose to control it inside the kernel. So, yeah. The, 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 the change is very simple. Just, uh, I think the, just write one register is, is fine. Just to, 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 to bump the frequency. Yes, is that going yeah. to work across all CPU families, across all vendors, across all generations for the last 20 years? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. So that's a, make it a kernel option. How, if you make it a kernel option, distros are not going to be able to pick it up. So oh, if, okay. if you want this to be a generic interface that anyone oh, can see. use, okay, it has okay. to be something that is generically callable. And if it requires 500 kilobytes of code addition in early boot up code, just to be able to configure all the different register con configuration combinations that there are, okay, that it's would not be going to scale. More generic, yeah. It needs to be some generic mm -hmm. interface. And, and the platform is the one that knows how to configure it. So it kind of makes sense to use it. Okay. Um, if you can, you may I mean, not want the higher and or the lower frequency. Just, right. just, just, yeah. just work hard with you, UEFI guys. Seriously, um, th th there has to be a way. Okay. I think it's it's the one point where it makes the most sense. Either, either, I mean, in in U-boot we do have code, for example, um, that does actually detect the uh, like whenever when when you enter the Linux kernel, it actually does configure the, the frequency to go up right at, at that point in time. There, there are those mechanisms around for firmware. Um, mm -hmm. It's just having something standardized and more explicit rather than an implicit, I'm booting the kernel, it probably wants to be fast mechanism, makes more sense. Because on the other hand, um, what you don't have, want to have, get, get into is a situation where uh, you boost up the frequency um, really high, 
and then the kernel does not have a CPU fact driver. So you keep at a really high frequency and eventually just burn out your CPU. Right? So you kind of want to give the control over whether you want to have that boost over to the OS. Yeah, okay. You're, you're talking about a more ge uh, general solution? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so what to do about non UEFI uh, firmware, like you boot with like just with device trees, but you would, you, would, you would with just device trees, you can still use UEFI, that's fine, it's all there. Um, just just ignore all the legacy boot paths, nobody cares anymore. We do. <laughs> no, <laughs> just that, that, then you might want to change the your boot flow. I mean, it, there, there is, mm. even with U boot these days, there's no reason not to use the UEFI boot path. It's size? Say again? Do you, do you know how much code si how, how, mu how much code size gets added by adding the UEFI option in U-Boot? It's uh, like uh, at least in Y. Say again? It's more than zero, yes. <laughs> but you can remove the fit support for it. So, so code size is one thing, uh, and it slows down the key exactly boot because kernel relocation is slower. But uh, the second thing is that uh, UEFI makes U-Boot uh, like boots slow because there is like more stuff that needs to be done pr prior to actually jumping to the kernel. Uh, in our experiments, it was like uh, non-trivial time, like almost half a second, I think. Half a second is definitely out of any league that we should see. If, if you're seeing half a second, we should work on it. Um, let's, let's get down together and, and, and just improve that, that situation sure, there. Sure. If, if we see anything in, in that boot flow that really gets us significantly slower, um, I, I'm not talking about like say one, two milliseconds, uh, Milliseconds, even yeah. That, that's that's along a a, a, a a timeline that I can certainly see it taking, but half a second is way off the charts, right? Um, yeah, yes, we need to load the kernel into memory, but we do that in any boot path. Uh, all the actual UEFI stuff, callbacks and such, they, they shouldn't add too much to it. Yeah, actually, and you raised a good point. Is uh, uh, universality with uh, uh, extreme performance? Uh, yeah, we if we want to apply to all platforms, we have to have a lot of trade-off. And if we just want to make to meet some uh, specific requirement for one specific platform, so you can do some not so decent way. Yes, if yeah. you if you're doing a yeah, hack, a if you're doing point, yeah. a hack, then you do the hack in your firmware, right? Yeah. Because I mean, you you as Intel, I'm sure you can change the firmware just fine. Um, no, not that easy. <laughs> ah, you can change your firmware just fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if you if you want to have a, a generic mechanism, which I really think we should have, I think that's a, that's a great idea. Um, boosting the kernel frequency on early boot is, is definitely um, a, a good way to get a faster boot boot times. Uh, we we should really talk about a generic interface. Okay, thank you. Uh, so so uh, for this picture, I think it's uh, pretty obvious, but I I still keep it. So we use a load a loadable module when possible. And we dis disable everything not necessary, but we need to be careful. Something will break the, 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 the kernel or panic. And we disable all the debug features for our release version. In our debug version, we still uh, have, have this uh, spin lock mutex and the F chess, uh, good stuff. But for release, we disable them, all of them. And usually uh, in the platform, we have some, a lot of hardware controllers but we don't actually use them. We disable them because um, everyone, every initialization will co cost some time. Uh, because uh, also the kernel size matters. If you reduce some modulus, some drivers, the kernel will be smaller. It will be a faster loading, a faster decompression. So, so in here you're saying that you want to use modules rather than compile things into the kernel, right? For the necessary ones. So for the necessary ones, yeah. yeah. But, uh, you, but you want, still want to use modules instead. Do you measure that modules actually are faster? I remember that a couple of years ago we managed to, or we, we, we did look at exactly um, that, that problem set of loadable modules, and they actually end up slowing the system down a lot. Yeah. Um, because you sequentially load initial, like like reload and relocate every single kernel module that you actually need to load, et cetera, et cetera. It just You're so right, it turned right. out to be a yeah. lot of overhead. Yeah, I, uh, I need to emphasize, uh, should emphasize before that, because uh, 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 what we've done is actually for our specific platform, and we need that the special uh, application. Actually, is a is a camera ca application need to be functional. So we did not only in the cloud stuff. We did in the user space stuff. We try to load the 
application faster. And the, the, those modulus, the lot less serial modulus are, lo are, loading, are loaded in parallel with, uh, with our camera application. Ah, uh, okay. So yeah, that's okay. specific for our platform, yeah. So you, you basically so, well, configure equals Y on all the options that you need to boot and yeah, then everything yeah. that's exactly, yeah. can be initialized later, you leave, leave as modules because yeah, yeah. If, then if you get the parallelism. Yeah, okay. yeah, right. So we're not doing the, the distribution stuff. So. Also, are, so, you, are you I, actually I getting more parallelism out of it? Because I, I remember that there was like a time at least a while back um, when loading a module meant you basically stopping the world. Is that, does it, did that disappear by now? I didn't try. Oh, sorry, I, I, I don't, yeah, I also okay. haven't checked. I had the same question actually, I, I wanted to ask, like, it, it, did you really measure the parallelism you were getting, like the per, uh, parallelization efficiency you've been getting like, by loading modules later, I, and uh, what kind of extra work you can do while they're being loaded? Uh, so f uh, for our platform, we, we, we don't have that much. So for the post, you cannot face uh, to be frankly, I, 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 I haven't done uh, much uh, profiling stuff. Uh, so f we, we only have several modulus and we keep those uh, which is needed by the camera application inside kernel building. And uh, we use, uh, use the asynchronous probing to make them put in parallel. For other stuff, we just uh, put it into modulus. So here's uh, so the potential optimization points. Uh, I will go through them one by one. Uh, the first one is the universality with the VS uh, performance. Uh, usually, in currently, uh, our driver wants to cover all the hardware with one copy of code, and uh, many. Uh, our experience shows that many long delay in the drivers is actually just to cover one broken hardware. And everybody else needs to pay for the, this specific broken hardware. Uh, for some example, it's uh, the graphics drivers. Uh, kind of graphics drivers will to detect the uh, configuration. It will read uh, 32 times or one register. And our, our platform, it could take about uh, 500 milliseconds. And previously, it just uh, to do, try to do read five times or three times. And later, when that, there's a broken monitors from Acer or, or some, some brand, so then the, the graphics driver changed it. They changed the retry number from five to 32. And, and, and similar things for the other driver, for our story driver. I think the, in the current uh, upstream, the SD host control driver, there's a one delay inside the uh, power related operation. It's uh, 10 milliseconds. Isn't that part of the spec? What? That, that could easily be a number that's part of the spec. That it just has, has to be there in order to power up a card, for example. Uh, yes, just to, for one, one card. For one for one type of controller, it, it is not uh, inside any of the spec spec. Uh, it's just to to cover one broken hardware. Okay. And uh, and I've I've tried uh, many platforms and uh, we don't need that delay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, so my question here is, uh, uh, can we just uh, add some uh, color parameters to to tune these uh, no. delays? <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's, so that's my my patch is why it's rejected by the maintainers. So so no no is a pretty obvious answer on that one. Always when, whenever you think about these cases, always don't don't, don't think of a specific embedded application. Mm. If you're doing think of distros, right? Yeah. That, that's that's okay. the easy way to to basically think on your own whether something like this could could get accepted. Yeah. Um, yeah works, however, is a really good idea, right? Che uh, check on check on PCI IDs, check on BMI IDs, check on whatever IDs. You will be able to easily get them in there. Or, or even just change the whole concept. Like, for example, if you're saying you're you're reading a register to detect the monitor, well, maybe doing that in a in a like work, uh, what is it called? Work queue, work item, work work. Um, it, it's it's a much 
smarter way of doing it than uh, pausing the initialization for it. Right? Yep. Oh, okay. Okay, we'll go faster. Okay. Uh, so here's uh, in kernel the, the the memory deferred initialization, uh, just uh, raised by this gentleman. So. So you, uh, just uh, the, after the, the SMP is initialized, the, 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 the all the calls in the system is up and running. We can just uh, do do some of the, of the to offload some of the memory initialization work. Uh, and another problem is uh, f f when doing the driver asynchronous probing, it will may mess up some of the controllers index for the like the UART, the spy, the I square C. Because the, the slave devices collecting to them rely on the fixed number. If we use a asynchronous probing, the, the, the controller index may be messed up. Okay, so. I mean, isn't UDEV supposed to address this? Excuse me? Isn't UDEV supposed to address this problem? Of uh, providing device names that are consistent across reboot? Generosity. I think uh, you, you, uh, we, yeah, we can try to do that, but uh, that will cost a lot of uh, extra efforts because we have the UART, we have the the spy, have the uh, as, as C for the for our platform, a lot, a lot of stuff. So uh, one possible solution is just to we add some the, the 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 platform data into the data structure of the device. We collect we we collecting the. PCID with some some fixed number. Uh, this may help help easily help the the situation. So uh, I used to have a a, a driver uh, a patch to make the uh, make to, to do the asynchronous probe, and recently I have to uh, drop it because of the, the, this problem. So I raised it here. Uh, so UDEV does work very well, but it requires round tripping from user to kernel, which means you have a huge context switch overhead, yeah. and it doesn't do it fast. So it does it well, but slowly. It doesn't do it early either. It doesn't do it early. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, next one is uh, parallelized uh, SMP initialization. So in, in our system, and uh, also I also provide some other system, uh, including servers. Usually, it uh, takes about uh, six to eight, ten milliseconds to bring up uh, one 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 CPU, uh, and it, it used to be more in the in the older kernel. Uh, so, kind of, I, I I don't don't know how to solve this, but I just think uh, there may be some space to improve here. Uh, kind of, all these uh, CPUs uh, was. Brought up by the online CPU uh, hot plug framework. Uh, maybe we can try to op optimize it. Uh, because for the larger system with a lot of CPUs, it, it, it really takes uh, quite some time. Uh, next one is the if formal initial sheet. Uh, in our existing, uh, in the final numbers, the form of the ACPI uh, initialization actually needs still take a lot of time because it is uh, it is running before the SMP is initialized. Oh, sorry, it's it is it's in the critical parts and it cannot be asynchronous now. Maybe we can just uh, uh, carefully check them. We don't need to do all them all of them in the critical parts and uh, uh, split them to different phase. Because for the general uh, device, I think they they could be enumerated later. Uh, I have a comment on the previous slide. Uh, okay. Have you checked where the time is spent uh, during the CPU initialization? Because from what I remember, uh, on some broken CPUs, it takes uh, a longer time to um, synchronize TSC, so that uh, there is like a delay loop which tests like. Uh, like how stable TSC is, and it's done on every single CPU. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah. so I mean, if uh, the hardware is not broken, you don't have to do that. And so it's just a possibility that th that's where you spend time to calibrate the TSC. Uh, the, I provide several platforms, uh, so uh, TSC is, is fine. It's just uh, some. It, it, 
when bring up a uh, kind of uh, each CPU, it will set up a lot of the user case thread and set up running a lot of the initialized function. There will be a big list for them, one by yeah, one. Yeah, I, I know uh, the stack is very deep for uh, uh, CPU initialization, but uh, just where you spend time there, like what, what actually, uh, like? Uh, uh, I haven't checked the very details, but it seems there's some uh, synchronization. They're waiting for something to, to arc. Okay, but, the, okay, oh, five minutes. Uh, so so we are almost done here. Uh, so the so last one I would mention is about the user space. So in, in, in one picture, previously we, we noticed that the, it takes a, uh, about 100 milliseconds to load in the system D. And the, for our platform, it's too much. So, so, uh, so we tried to use some lightweight initial program uh, which uh, will just uh, try to uh, load the necessary uh, stuff and do use the Red Hat to preload some libraries. Uh, then just uh, start our the camera application. Uh, with that, we, we, with uh, using uh, that, we, we could get some time back. And, uh, also, my, uh, my, my question is, can we just add the initial program then into the command line to do some preloading stuff? Okay. It's already there, it's called init equals. There's, there's a command line option to define the initial init program as well as init arguments. So if, if init equals is always the last parameter, you define that and then after that comes your executable and your, your parameters. It's all there. You mean the preloading? You mean, uh, I, I think he's asking a different question. He doesn't want to specify a knit, he wants to preload a knit. Yes. So command yes. line option for the boot chart, you have, yeah, we already do that. Uh, it's just preload. Oh, sorry, I'm making it clear as a preload. We just you uh, once the, the root file system is mounting, it just start preloading the initial program so that uh, we, we don't have to wait. Blocking code, wait, 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 wait for, how, for how, it. How much time do you have in between the root file system is mounted and you're actually trying to find that application? the call in the kernel that tries to find in it. How much time do you spend in between those two time points in time? Uh, for the loading time is actually the, the discrete time. So, so. I, what I'm saying is the, the kernel needs to be able to access the, the volume, right? It needs to be a, able to actually fi find that inner process. So it needs to have a driver loaded for the, the sort of storage backend. It needs to have the file system loaded. It needs to actually have the file system mounted, et cetera, et cetera, correct? At which stage right, are you trying right. to you, Okay, you mean already there's not much space for doing the preloading? So, so I think what Alex is saying is you may not have the time to do the preload. Is that your argument? Yeah. What, what I'm saying is maybe the, the time that you have to preload is about two milliseconds, and then it's it moved. Because by the time the, from, from the kernel boot flow, by the point in time you search for the root, root uh, target, um, mm -hmm. you mount the root target, and, and you try to load in it and execute it, um, th th that's almost like two functions calls, co function calls right after each other. There's, there's very little time in, in between those, those points in time, which means if you wanted to do that, you would basically have to completely take the whole boot flow upside down in Linux. Yeah, um, yeah. And instead of parsing the root target, root equals parameter in, in, in on the command line, pass, pass that really late, you would have to pass that, I don't know, like dynamically as soon as you load drivers. I, I have no idea. It, 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 that's yeah, yeah, flow that we don't have it, yeah, at okay. all. Yeah. You could put it in an init parameter. Uh, well, okay. Um, so Tim, Tim was just saying um, you could put it into an init parameter. Uh, how how does that buy you any time? Now, okay, I think he's walking up. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, this one you can. Um, oh yeah, there you go. Yeah, Pierce uh, has one for you. So just one one quick thing. Take a look at Alpine. Uh, Alpine's a distro that works very well for embedded systems. The unit's very small, it takes an incredibly small amount of time, and it's it's easy to optimize this kind of problem, um, especially when you're transitioning to user land. Okay. I get I guess my observation on this particular item was uh, if you put the uh, system D image into a NITRAMFS, I don't know if that'll 
if that's possible, if that screws you up, but knit manifest is gonna be in memory before you mount the other file systems. The other, I wanted to back up uh, several slides to your issue of, um, uh, keep going, let me see. It was your, no, keep going. Yeah, can we handle them in a better way? So there's a couple of classes of kernel issues that fall into this category of they're highly specialized depending on your configuration and your hardware that you, you can't, it's very hard to share them with the rest of the community because of that, right? So you wanna make a way to parameterize, parameterize the kernel so that you can cut out cruft that you're not gonna use, but you can't, it, it's then very hard to share that with other people. Uh, there's not really a kernel mechanism. You know, you brought up the kernel parameter tuning, mm -hmm. um, but that still leaves some poor soul at another company to go through and find all those parameters again and to hand tune them. Yeah. And so it seems, I, I, don't, I don't have a solution here, but it seems like a better approach to the problem would be to set up some kind of system where like all this information that you've got is really, really good, but it's, you know, five years from now, it's gonna be buried, you know, on, the, on a plumber's video somewhere on YouTube. And, uh, and someone's gonna have to do this all over again. And so it would be nice if there was a sharing, a place where you could share this stuff. I'm not sure that the kernel source tree is the right place. Uh, maybe it is, but maybe we need to actually think about some other place where we can sh share this type of tuning information. Like you guys went through a lot of trouble to get this information. It's hard won. It'd be nice to be able to share it with other people, but I'm not, I don't, I don't have a solution for how to do that sharing or where to sure, do that sharing, but. Yeah, yeah. You, actually for these things, I, actually I have uh, submitted some uh, patches to the upstream menus trying to figure, uh, just as uh, Alexa said, uh, they got rejected because of the bring, bring the new kind of parameters. So yeah, so you think we need to add something inside the kernel documentation for these things, so? Maybe documentation has a role in that as well. So, so, so my, my suggestion, be, be simple, quick one, is that there's a web page called Kernel Newbies, um, which is a wiki, which you can just add a page to and say, well, if you want to optimize boot, fa boot time really fast, look at these items. And by the way, these are some low hanging fruits to potentially optimize with alternatives upstream going forward. I'm going um, to so throw an NMI projects. in here. Uh, we're now in the break time. Right. We're past the um, time, so um, if you have a lot more, I would suggest scheduling a buff or you know finding a hack room and continuing there. If people want to keep chatting until the next speaker comes in, I'm not going to stop you, but just so people know that they're in the break. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you.